Hey everybody and welcome back to Beginner's Fab. My name is Eric McGrew. I'm the host of the show, of course, and today we're going to be talking about making our own shackles for a leaf spring suspension. Shackles are actually pretty simple pieces to make if you do it right the first time. Now, it's not super high-tech fabrication, that's for sure. They can be more complicated or less complicated depending on what it is that you want to do with your shackles. Uh, depending on how long they are, you may want to put a gusset in between them, that kind of stuff. However, what I'm doing is I'm building shackles that have center to center, uh, four and a half inches of spacing. So they're not real long and therefore I don't need a gusset between them. These are also three sixteenths. So I am just going to be cutting out the pieces that I need, four of them, two for each side of the uh, suspension. And since I only have a rear suspension or a rear leaf spring suspension, that's all that I'll need. Now, there are a couple of things that you need to keep in mind though, because the idea is you want them to look somewhat uniform and somewhat professional if at all possible. So what I've done here is I've used a piece of 3 16 by three flat plate because that's what I had laying around. And then I had to go through a, different, a few different steps to get to this. So let's talk about those steps. Here you can see I took a piece of 3 inch by uh, 3 16 flat bar and I used a pre-made uh, shackle that I had made out of just some scrap material before to give me an idea and I am marking now all the different uh, measurements needed. You can see that I marked the width of the flat bar down the center. I also marked uh, the length that I needed and then I marked the center of that to be able to measure out and get the bolt holes where they needed to be. Now I only have a pilot hole uh, punched in here with a center punch and now I have the caliper out measuring the two holes to make sure they match where they should be. Here I'm just showing that I used an old drill bit that I had dulled the end off and ground it down to make a punch and now right in front of where that tip of that drill bit is is where I'm going to make a center punch that's a little bit deeper, a little bit bigger to center punch the holes for the bolt hole pass throughs and then that way it makes sure that the drill bit doesn't walk around and it stays how it should. If you've never used a center punch, it's not that hard. It's pretty simple. Um, you just line it up and then with a hammer you hit the center punch right on the edge of the hole where it should be or in the center of the hole where it should be really where you marked it and then it puts a little dimple in the metal. It doesn't need to be super deep but deep enough so that the bit won't walk around and it stays centered on that hole so that when you make all your drill, uh, when you drill all your holes, they're right where you wanted them to be. Now here I have a vice grip clamping all of my different um, shackle materials or you know the pieces that I've cut down for the different shackles which are of course four, two for each side. And I have uh, used the steel that you see under them to align them, uh, make them even on the sides. And then I clamped them with a pair of vice grips so that now I can actually tack weld them together and then I will put them in the um, portable drill press that I have. It's a cheap drill press, but it actually works pretty well, and it just uses a hand drill. It's not the best one out on the market, and it's not the most precise, but it will work for this kind of project. Here you'll see that I actually have it in the portable drill press. It's um, tack welded on the, all four of the pieces are tack welded on the side to keep them straight. I do have the uh, vice grips or the pressure clamps still on the material just to help me hold the material straight while I'm drilling. And with these bolts here, or these holes here that I'm drilling with a standard drill bit, I keep them all um, clamped and tacked together just to make sure that the holes all line up. And I'm using WD-40 as a lubricant. It doesn't need to be a heavy oil, but any kind of lubricant like that is a good idea. It saves the life of your drill bits and it keeps from making the drill bits brittle and it also helps get through all the metal and get every all the shards out of it. What you see here is that while I still had the pieces of metal all clamped together, I started to use the unibit or the step bit on it um, just to mark the holes. But once I got the first portion of these holes marked, the um, what I had to do was go and actually cut these apart. I just ground the um, 
the tack welds off and then I went ahead and was able to drill out each one to the size that I needed. In this case I needed 9 16 hole and I drilled each one to that size. I would like to also mention that you'll notice here in these photos that the uh, different shackles are, or all the shackles are narrower than they were with the other photos, and that's because I actually cut a couple, uh, an inch off each side to make, or half an inch off to make them actually two inches wide instead of three. So um, that's why I had to do extra grinding, which you'll see in the next photo on the sides, and I align them all up as I uh, go ahead and mentioned with these bolts. Something that's pretty important to keep in mind while doing this is that if you're going to use a step bit like I was because I couldn't find a drill bit that was actually the size I needed, um, when you're dealing with anything over an eighth inch thick, then the step bit probably won't be your best um, fit for drilling all the way through. So you'll want to drill until you hit the shoulder of the next step, but then you'll want to flip the piece of plate over and drill from the other side so that you don't have um, shoulders on the outside edges that are bigger than the inside of the material itself. That's just how it works with step bits, so be careful of that. With these here, you can see that I've already ground them down a little bit and I have the bolts put in them to show that they're even and they're processed in the right way. But I had to do a process right before this. So what I did was I actually used these same bolts and then I put these plates together because I had already drilled them out and I put the bolts through them pushed all the plates tightly together and then I have a handheld belt sander put metal I put a metal um, grinding disc on there or belt on there and then I flip it upside down and I run it and I use it to actually grind all of these smooth as they should be if there's huge variances in them I use an angle grinder with a flap wheel or a um, grinding flat disc on it to get them down to where they need to be fairly close and then I do it this way. Just remember that with any of these power tools don't run them for more than 15 minutes at a time, 20 minutes at a time without giving them a 20 minute rest or so. So once I had everything all um, measured up and ground down to be even, I took the angle grinder with a flat sanding disc or grinding disc with 36 grit sandpaper and then I started sanding both sides and the edges of this um, of these pieces of flat bar that I had turned into shackles so that I could be able to make sure that I had enough teeth in the material to be able to paint them with the coating that I was using um, which is going to be the spray on spray can bed liner from Sherwin Williams before I can actually get around to doing the spray on bed liner though, I had to do something else. I had to wash them first. Um, once I ground or sanded them down with the grinding disc or the flat sanding disc, I had to make sure I washed them so that they were clean of contaminants and that they would uh, actually ad allow the paint to adhere. Uh, spray on bed liners like any other paint if the material on which you're trying to apply it is oily or greasy it's not going to adhere so under the um, basic standards of being at home I just use what is typical dish soap liquid dish soap and as you can see I wash my hands first and then I use a garden hose and water and wash them off or you can use rubbing alcohol or anything like that to accomplish the same thing A couple of the reasons that I use the spray on bed liner are because it's really simple to apply, it's very very basic in its form, and it hides a lot of imperfections. And doing outside work like I do, there I, I don't usually get the finish that I would like. Plus, the spray on bed liner, if you allow it to cure, is really uh, durable. It, it works well. And on top of that, it's really easy to repair in the future with a couple of um, wire brushes, a angle grinder maybe, um, you know, a putty knife, something like that, or a box cutter. You can 
cut out pieces of the bed liner that have gotten uh, damaged or become damaged or whatever over time and then you can apply new bed liner on top of it and not even notice the texture is great because it hides a lot of the imperfections too so it has its benefits to to using it now a couple of things to keep in mind is that it's a little harder to get it to look right if you have to paint one side and then the other side plus it's a fairly thick material so you want to be careful about how you apply it therefore you can see I set up a, a little hanging system on our clothesline and I painted the bed liner on these um, shackles in that way now bed liner is thicker so don't forget to make sure you spend some effort getting inside the holes and don't forget to paint the edges of the uh, shackles or whatever it is that you're painting with bed liner and in this case definitely shackles and then go back and and paint the the flat areas because the edges are always going to be your thinnest area and they're going to be the areas that have a tendency to tear or show through easiest so if you cover those first and then cover the flat areas all that overspray melds into the edges it's not as noticeable and you get extra coverage on them It's always good to remember that once you get done spraying up close, step back and overspray if you want that textured look and then that also helps hide a little bit of the um, errors or scratching in the material. Something else that I would like to mention that I didn't mention earlier is before you go through the process of uh, grinding and painting and all that stuff, make sure you test fit these to make sure that your lines do actually line up and that they fit. I did that, I just didn't show you that I did that. Then you can install them like I've done here and that will uh, give you a good overview of how these will look and how they'll work. And then, of course, I took measurements after I had installed them to make sure that they fit the way that they should. And mine turned out uh, really nice. They, they work perfectly for my needs. So in the end, to make shackles, it's not really that difficult. A couple things you need to make sure you keep in mind are the fact that you want to make sure you measure center. You have your, your holes aligned on all of them equally. So... It's at best, if you can, use a drill press or something like that. Use a pilot hole or a punch to mark it. And then clamp them all together or tack them all together as I did. And then drill through it, making sure that those holes align. And then once all that's done, trim, shape them, whatever you need to do like that. And then paint them to keep them from uh, corroding or rusting. Uh, you know, you can use spray paint. I use spray on our spray can bed liner. It's pretty good stuff as well, but you can use an enamel spray paint. You can use whatever you want. You can send them out to have them powder coated, whatever the case may be. And of course, if you're going to put the uh, gussets in there, make sure that when you weld them, it doesn't make them shift out of square so that the holes don't line up. And of course, when you do all of that, if you're going to make shackles that have a um, center to center hole then uh, that are over five inches separated you want to make sure you add a gusset if they're under five inches separated then a gusset's probably not that uh, needed or five and a half inches really so a few basics to keep in mind with all of this it's really not rocket science it's one of the best and easiest projects you can start with for a um, beginner fabricator and it helps you get used to using all these different tools. I use the belt sander. You don't have to use a belt sander. It's not a bad idea if you can. That way you can get a little bit uh, more uniform look to them. And of course, you'll need your basic tools, angle grinder, drill, welder, um, if you're gonna be doing the gussets, and the various bits that you need so that you can get those to the, the place you want. If you have a plasma cutter, great, you can cut bigger holes. I use the unit bits to get the bigger holes, but remember, for using the step bits or unit bits, you can only use up to around 3 16 plate, uh, quarter inch plate, because beyond that, they don't pass through, even flipping them over all the way, because the shoulders aren't deep enough on those unit bits or the step bits. So there's just a few points uh, that you can keep in mind for your project. I hope that it was uh, beneficial for you guys. I hope that you like the information. 
Please don't forget to stop by and see my other videos at beginnersfab.com. You'll also see some articles and stuff about uh, equipment reviews as well as ideas and concepts of welding and fabricating and stuff. And this is all stuff that I'm learning too. So I'm, I'm transmitting the information as I find it and as I learn about each of these steps. And then also, if you want to talk more off-roading, you want to hear more about uh, that kind of stuff, go over to offroadindependence.com. I also have videos over there talking about different aspects of suspensions, uh, vehicles, and modifications, uh, concepts that are good to keep in mind, that kind of stuff as well. And of course, please, if you want to support us, go by zazzle.com forward slash off-road independence, uh, and you can um, find some stuff there to buy t-shirts, hoodies, stickers, that kind of stuff, uh, hats. Any support that you give would be greatly appreciated. So thanks again, and I hope you enjoy this video, and I hope to see you in the next one.